the end of the day, your job is to truthify the character. Stanislavski said, it doesn't matter what you think about the character, right? That's really important. You don't judge the character. It doesn't matter what you think about the character. All that matters is what the character thinks. Hello and welcome back to the Spiritual Psychology of Acting podcast. This week, we are diving into the world of villains. The Joker, Moriarty, Darth Vader, Norman Bates, Sauron, Voldemort, the list of classic villains we all love to hate is endless. They're often the most interesting parts for an actor to get their teeth into, but how do actors avoid playing a cliché and make sure their villain is psychologically truthful and three-dimensional? In this episode we discuss all of that and more, it's a fascinating subject and a packed conversation, so let's jump straight into it. So, villains, the dark side of humanity. (laughs) Yeah, I've I've been looking forward to this one. Yeah, a tasty, tasty prospect. (laughs) Well, it's a fascinating look at aspects of the human psyche, isn't it? It's it's, it's this, the shadow aspect of the psyche. Yeah. The devil has all the best chins, as they say. (laughs) That's what they say. (laughs) And often, you know, for an actor, it's it's a joy to create those parts, which we'll talk about more about, you know, um, you know, as far as the spiritual psychology of acting is concerned, how that's done effectively. Yeah. Yeah. So probably a good place to start is by analyzing and discussing the villain in dramatic context. So, so what is the purpose of the villain in drama? Okay. So in a, in a well-told drama, you have, uh, a hero and you have an opponent to the hero and the opponent usually represents the antithesis you know given that the hero um advocates the thesis or what the hero learns is the thesis of the piece you know the revelation that the hero has you know you you know somewhere towards the end of the of the uh, of the film or the play uh, you know, this is in tradition. There's, there's many exceptions to this, but it, it traditionally, the the hero sort of advocates the, the thesis of the play, or certainly learns the thesis of the play, and the opponent is the antithesis, the antithesis of that. So, what we're talking about really there are values, you know, and a discourse between different values of the hero and the values of the opponent. And if you look at the, you know, in mythology, when you look at the structure of the psyche that really the hero represents the self and then the different other characters within the drama represent different aspects of the psyche itself and one of the important aspects of the psyche is of course the shadow of the psyche Mm -hmm. and so often the the well traditionally the uh, opponent will be a shadow figure a shadow to the hero And it needs to be a perfectly designed opponent for that hero, you know, and um, the bigger the opponent or the more dastardly the opponent, uh, the bigger the hero has to be in order to overcome the opponent and win the goal of the drama, whatever the end end goal is. Um, So the, the, the villain is a really key part of the drama and of course you know looking at the 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 whole creation as a drama uh you have to have these two opposing forces you know in the hindu mythology um it's there's a lot of in the ramayana the epic hindu stories from from the hindu culture they have what's known as the asuras they're the the demons and the dewa which are the gods And creation itself is said to be weaved between these two polarities of what we could call good and what we could call evil. (laughs) Um, And that's where the drama takes place between those two poles. And so you have to have that opposition in creation, let alone in a drama or a play, for the play to play out. You know, even at the, the, the beginning of the universe, 
uh, after the Big Bang, there was a, if you like, battle between matter and antimatter. And um, of course, if the antimatter had have won, then creation wouldn't be able to take place. It was the matter that, that won that, that little battle. And that battle yeah. goes on continuum. And then that's the polarity between a positive and a negative pole. And life is the drama that's weaved between those two poles. So they're necessary in the drama of life. And they're also necessary in, of course, films of, in plays because they depict the drama. Uh, there's an interesting thing here that I picked out. This is from, from Good Company. And this is a sayings of a, a wise man, Sri Shantananda Saraswati, that we hear a lot from in the course in terms of the spiritual knowledge. Um, it's very simple. He said, what we call good and what we call evil both exist in the world as necessary antidotes to each other. At times, the so-called good becomes proud of itself and therefore ceases to be good. Then the evil arises to destroy it. Similarly, when the evil outstrips its function, it is destroyed by the good. We see examples of this in history, and especially in times like ours, whilst everything is in the melting pot. So this um, play out, you know, I like that term. He says that everything is in the melting pot in the in the times that we're living in now. Is mm -hmm. there is a great playing out between the values, and we're seeing it. You know, we see a shift in values in society, and we see more a greater polarity as well between those values um, that we've certainly seen over the last few years in in, in modern history. Uh, that the polarity, and of course. Uh, the both sides always claim to be the good and the opponent <laughs> is always the evil. So yeah. it's all relative. It's a bit like Shakespeare said that there is no good or evil, but thinking makes it so. He also said there is no darkness but ignorance. Mm. So that's the real battle, you know, and this is this sort of ancient um, mythological battle that goes on within the hearts of people. And it's between these two energies of the uh, you know asuras, the, the 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 demonic aspect and the dewa, the godly aspect that they play out in all of us. You could say, you know, like in the Gita, the great battle of Kurusheka, which is the the battle of uh, the where Sri Krishna is the is the charioteer of the warrior Arjuna. That really that battle uh, between those two opposing forces is it's an analogy of the battle that goes on in the hearts of people similarly the the fabled um battle of uh, you know the great battle of armageddon where the, the the forces of good and evil will will come uh to each other uh and fight it out again you could look at that as a symbology of what's taking place within people um because we all have choices and in drama we're, we're guided and we we see the consequence of choices mm -hmm. and we get to see it you know um, people, in my experience, people don't like to be told, but they do like to be shown and they do like to find out. Yeah. Uh, and in great dialogue, what's really important in understanding, in, in, you know, as a writer in writing great dialogue, the question I'm all, always asking myself when writing dialogue is what are the values being purported here by mm -hmm. these two characters and what do they represent? And that really helps you to hone the dialogue in a drama. That's really interesting, that whole um dichotomy of you know the the and thesis and antithesis it's, it's, it's a bit of a cliche isn't it that you hear that the the villain is the other side of the same coin of of the the hero and often i think in, in a badly written drama like you say there it's just it's something that is said in the dialogue but not shown and i think a good a good way of testing out a, a villain is if you were to take that villain out of that particular drama and replace it with any other villain in history would the story still work and if it does still work, then you obviously got a bad villain. Yeah, well, structurally speaking, the shadow figure or the opponent should be the ideal opponent. Yeah. And if you look at it psychologically, that it represents the shadow of the psyche of the hero. Mm -hmm. And the hero will have um, two needs. The hero at the beginning of the story has a psychological need 
And that refers to how their actions, thinking and behavior is, is hurting themselves. And they will have a moral need, which is how their actions, thinking and behavior are affecting other people. So obviously those think that represents a shadow of the psyche of the hero. So a well-designed villain, you know, structurally in writing, um, would have those qualities that you can work out the idea by understanding what the you know the hero's goal is and what the hero has to learn and what their psychological and moral needs are. You can work out the ideal opponent for that character. Mm. And, and and last week we we talked about love, how many people confuse that as a feeling when it's really a choice and it's an action. So then conversely, you know, is evil a choice? You know, can somebody be absolutely purely evil does that does that exist well in, in modern psychiatry they don't they don't use the term evil uh similarly they don't use the term uh ego except for in in the freudian sense of ego uh which we might come on to but the now they use the term the narrative self is what we would have called the ego is the narrative mm -hmm. self which i think is a much better description because mm -hmm. the narrative self it's exactly that. It's a story. You know, what does it mean getting to know someone is they tell you their story. Mm. And in, in what is that really, psychologically speaking, it's a set of mental pictures and impressions. And we know because of cognitive distortion and cognitive dissociation, etc., what we tend to do is we rewrite the story. The story of our lives um, is different. It's been edited and modified uh, in the light of what else is going on in the psyche. So if you really look at what it, what is a, a human character, it's a story. It's a narrative of pictures. And that's really, un really useful to understand as an actor because that's when you're creating the character. What you're really creating is a story which is a collection of pictures from the past of the character. By pictures, I mean mental pictures, uh, me mental pictures that come with the data of all five senses, including a sixth sense, which we call atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, and that's really what you're creating when you're creating a character, it's a narrative self. Um, but back to the, to the main point is that um, what is uh, evil or what is the, you know, what, what is it that we call evil? I always like to think the, the easiest uh, way of understanding evil which isn't in psychiatry, right? So they don't talk, someone isn't evil in psychiatry. We'll talk about what, what the various um, psychological descriptions are in a moment. But um, evil is live backwards. If you spell the word live backwards, you get the word evil. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that's interesting because in, in psychology, you have the libido impulse, which we touched on in the last episode, which is the love or life impulse. And then you have the mortido impulse, mort, death. So the life and the death impulse. So psychologically speaking, if someone who would be called evil, so-called evil, they would be driven by mortido tensions. And it's important to understand that the mortido tensions arise because of a thwarted libido tension. So you have to love something before you can hate something, you know. So uh, when that comes to creating so-called evil characters, um, what's important is to create where has this character's libido, and I don't mean sexual libido, I mean their propensity to live and love. Um, they form an object of their libido, something that they love and they wish to serve or, or they, they become attached to. How has that been thwarted? And what you're looking at there very often is trauma. So the villain would have experienced some kind of trauma in the past, which has given them their desire to take revenge or they've been disempowered and therefore they wish they want power because they've been disempowered in some ways. And we see this a lot in the uh, modern, you know, like in the Joker story. Uh, yeah. The film that came out um, with Joaquin Phoenix a few years ago, it, that was really interesting because it, we we went into the psychology 
of the Joker and how the Joker had become the Joker and psychologically truthified the character. Yeah. You know, which is great. It pulls it out of that, you know, two dimensional cliche that you have that he's just a villainous uh, person and you create a human being. It's also part of a trend, isn't it, in TV and film of making villains more empathetic, you know, that we as the audience understand their point of view a bit more. I mean, it's 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 kind of rife, isn't it? That It's almost kind of way, way out of fashion now to have a cookie cutter villain that we all love to hate. It's like an, or a personification of evil. It's always that grey area where we kind of we do side with the villain sometimes, even if it is in you know Avengers and it's a big purple alien that wants to destroy half the planet. We kind of go, we kind of see his point of view at some points. Yeah, and that's well, what makes them really dangerous is when when they feel justified. I think yeah. of um, a good example of that is Robert De Niro's character. Uh, in the movie Cape Fear, in the movie Cape yes. Fear, yeah. Robert De Niro's character is has been wronged by that lawyer, and or at least he feels that he's been wronged. You know, remember he's got the big tattoo of the scales of justice on his back, <laughs> and uh, he's out for revenge. And what makes the character so interesting is you get a sense of the character's pain. And because the characters had pain, that's what makes them really dangerous and scary because mm. they're reacting to that pain and that damage that they feel that they've been caused. And that's really important in, in if you want to avoid cliche in creating, you know, the baddie, because what we don't want in, in good drama is, you know, bad, badness for badness's sake. <laughs> yeah. That's melodrama, really. In melodrama, <laughs> you get that. Um, but in, in a good drama... Uh, you would get uh, a character you have to create, first of all, for example, if the character wants to to make people suffer or to, to, to take revenge, and often to take revenge means to make other people suffer for the suffering that they feel that they've been caused. It's not necessarily the person that caused them the suffering that they want to take revenge on. It could be their, you know, their um, narcissistic stepfather or, or or something that they want to take revenge on, but they've transferred that onto other people and those mortido tensions are trying to find their expression through aggressive actions mm. um but traditionally you would say that that in 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 psychological terms um what would make a, a typical villain would be that they would either be a psychopath or they would be a sociopath and so what's the difference between a psychopath and a sociopath? Well, the um, really, those words aren't really used in modern psychiatry anymore. Now that the both are what, what used to be called those words are more called um, antisocial personality disorder. So it's not a, a noun, a psychopath. Uh, it's a branding of, of someone there, a psychopath. It's more looking at what's the disorder that they're, they're suffering from. Um, and uh, in very simple terms, I mean, really, it, it, uh, I was studying Eric Byrne, his uh, Layman's Guide to Psychiatry and Psychoanalysis, and it, which is a fascinating book, uh, but it's quite dated. But at that time, he was saying that we that we don't use the word psychopath anymore. We've got a new term, which is sociopath. But in modern understanding, there is a difference between a psychopath and a sociopath, and that is a psychopath is said to be born um and that uh being born that relates to the brain structure mm. so what they found that in in psychopaths and also in um uh, what's also termed as borderline personality disorder, which is probably more accurately called uh, emotional dysregulation disorder. Uh, borderline, it's an old term. It, it means um, borderline psychopath, essentially. So they're on the borderline of being a, a psychopath. Oh, yeah. And what, But what makes a psychopath is, uh, in terms of brain structure, is first of all, they have a reduced... Uh, amygdala and the amygdala regulates negative emotions 
So it regulates fear, aggression, anxiety, that kind of thing. They've also been found to have uh, a problem with the uh, hippocampus, which regulates behavior and self-control. So the, the impulses aren't able to be. So the mortido impulses, which, you know, in Freudian terms, uh, Freud talked of the id, um, which is Latin for it, the it. <laughs> and uh, that's the, the part of the psyche, psyche or the unconscious or subconscious psyche, which is full of all the libido and mortido tensions. And often they're repressed by what in Freud he called the ego. And the ego, not in, you know, when someone's egotistic, we're not talking about that, you know, in a narcissistic sense, but uh, ego meaning the part of the mind that has moral values and regulates the id tensions. And then he had what, what he called the superego, which would be akin to what we call on the course of the buddhi, the, um, the discriminatory part of the mind that sees the reason between the two. Mm -hmm. And if the hippocampus is uh, not functioning properly, then the id tensions can take over. So what, what in, in, a, in, in a normal, so-called normal healthy person, they, they would have certain aggressive tensions that they would be able to uh, hold on to or repress or not act upon or reason out or find some forgiveness or, you know, something like that. Yeah. Someone with a with, with when that's reduced is they're they they're unable to control those tensions the other one is called the orbital frontal cortex and that's involved in planning and decision making so if that's a bit squiffy if there's some problems there it's either reduced or it isn't operating normally then people are, are unable to see the consequence of their actions. So they act on more on, on impulse. And mm -hmm. traditionally speaking, that would be what we would call a, a psychopath would be born um, uh, in, in such a way. A sociopath, on the other hand, is learned. So sociopaths are created by their circumstances and their, their childhood. Whereas the psychopaths are, are born like it, as it were. And um, that, that's, both of these are really individuals who are unable to restrain, restrain themselves from doing things which are hurtful for others. Um, that's the point. So in other words, their, their ability to repress or negotiate their id impulses have been reduced so they act just purely on impulse mm -hmm. and that's what makes them dangerous if it if it's a, a thwarted libido they've got and they've got a, a mortido impulse they'll just go and uh, hurt the person you know they want to cause harm to others so that's that's re really the, the the difference between the two so what what then is the psychology of a villain like you were, you were talking there about the the psychopath and sociopath, and it made me think a little bit of Lalo Salamanca from Better Call Saul, and he's terrifying because he seemingly doesn't play by society's rules. People are just, you know, if they're in the way, then he'll get rid of them. There's, you know, no consequences for murder or anything that doesn't figure into his his kind of mind at all. But then he does he does have moral values and judgments. They're just different from what we would normally see played out in most people in society they're selective um mm. in a sociopath what you'll often find uh the, the sociopath will have a moral code uh they will have some kind of moral code but it's a selective moral code and mm. usually the moral code has been um brought in from outside you know it's it's the good book uh, or another leader or something that it, it, they haven't, it isn't based on their own moral values that, that they've realized through, through living and existing. It's been imposed and regulated from the outside. So if the Bible says, you know, uh, an eye for an eye, um, then an eye for an eye, it's, vin it's vindicated in the book. So they'll live mm. by that moral code. It's one that isn't created of their own accord. 
or more commonly, I guess, you get people who take the Bible out of context. They'll take one or two verses and then run with that because it speaks to a part of their psyche that they want to, you know, let rip. It's like um, a Portia in The Merchant of Venice and says, it says that uh, even the devil himself can cite scripture for his own purposes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's the psychology of a villain. Obviously, we, we see there's the kind of whole kind of cause and effect side of it that, you know, that either they're born with it or that they've learned it through, you know, their parents or their caregivers or the people that surrounded them when they were younger. We understand the psychology of it. How then, as actors, do we avoid cliché and begin to act villains that are three-dimensional? Well, if we if we take the uh, example of Tracy Letts' play Killer Joe and the character of Killer Joe, which is something I always present as a great model of a play mm -hmm. to work on with students. We offer, yeah, it's it's the model of ten, the 10 steps of creating a character because it's just such a well-written play and the characters are so clearly um, functionally created and they, you know, they, they have very clear different functions and they're so psychologically well written as well. Um, if we take the main character there of killer Joe Cooper himself, uh, you could say that, you know, he has psychopathic tendency. I mean, you know, the man's a hitman. It's a very particular career choice that you you want to kill people for a living. I mean, he's also a detective and sometimes gets to um, investigate cases of murders that he himself has committed, which, which is an interesting situation. Um, but if you look at that character, clearly the character, in terms of the character's purposes, the character wants to take revenge. You know, if they want, if they want, if they want to strangle people or kill them, there's some vengeance. There's some gratification of an id mortido based id tension uh, in the in the expression of that. So we would go for purposes like I think in the mind triad in the in the basic structure, the, you know, the foundations of the character, the super purpose or the super op, the super objective purpose would be. I want to take revenge to be powerful. But then what makes it interesting is you then have to truthify it. And by truthify it is make it psychologically truthful of why would the character want that? And so there are certain clues in the play. There's a scene in the play where he's talking to another character, Dottie, and they've got this, um, uh, by all intents and purposes, a date. Uh, they're having a date and she, she's this uh, younger girl and um, she asks him, are you married? And he says, maybe. And she says, what does that mean? And he says, it means no. And then she says, why not? And he pauses for a moment and he says, because women are deceitful and lying and vicious and vituperative and black hearted and evil and old. Now, that's a very particular <laughs> sentence to make. And what does that show us? That's what we would call, within, within the spiritual psychology of acting, we would call that the character's woman image, you know, the fundamental relationship he has with women. And where is the woman image created? What's the first woman we have a relationship with? Uh, traditionally speaking, it would be the mother, wouldn't it? We took it there in analysing the character that he's referring to his mother, an old, you know, that's a particular thing. Um, now, so what's happened to him, it's, he's, he's got mother damage, right? He's been, he'd been damaged by his mother. And, and also that's what resonates with the character of Dottie because she's also been damaged with her mother, by her mother. And when those two characters meet, their resonant vibration of their thinking matches each other and they do what we call falling in love, right? There's a, there's a resonant vibration between those two thinkings. They've both been victims of their mother. So what do we make Killer Joe in order to truthify him wanting to take revenge to be powerful, which seems to be his super OP, his super objective purpose in the play? What we went for was this, that he thinks his self-image 
what we call the super image. The self image is the really the main building block of the character. It's the most important question you ask is who does this character think they are? Mm -hmm. The super image of this character is what we came up with is this. He's the dirty son of a whore. He believes himself to be the dirty son of a whore. So his mother was a prostitute. This isn't in the play, right? We made this up yeah. to truth or false. So his mother was a prostitute. She moved from town to town, plying her trade. And he doesn't know who his father was. He could have been any, any one of the punters. Um, and so he, 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 he lacks that. And she's an alcoholic. And she gets him sort of working for him, opening the door to clients, showing them in. And he's seeing disgusting things and mistreatment of her from a very early age which has made him both hate men because he's seen the way his mother was treated and he's seen the darkest side of, of you know, a human sexual aggression. And he's also hates his mother because she never protected him and that she was responsible and she put him in that place. So then we create for the character what we call a life situation. So a life situation is a moment of intense imprinting and in printing, I borrowed from um, zoology. It's uh, it's where certain ideas become imprinted into the psyche. Really impo important, fundamental ideas. That's how you create the character's self-image. You give them a life situation. Mm. And the life situation we had for him is that, you know, uh, there's a knock at the door in this tatty flat that she's got in 1960s Texas above a shop. And uh, he goes and answers the door and there's this big, ugly punter has come to see his mother and he's smoking a cigar and he's got this sort of like um, big suede jacket. And he comes in and he looks around, he says, piece of shit. And he flicks his uh, ash on the little boy's head, on little Joe's head. And the, and the actors get into active imagination. They're imagining all this. And then he goes in and then you hear him having, you know, the, the character hears the guy having sex with his mother and he, it gets quite rough. And then when he comes out doing up his buckle, you know, on, on his belt and the, the kid's been playing with his hat with a motor car he's found, a little toy car that's only got three wheels that he found out on the street. And he's been going around the rim of it and there's like dirty brill cream. You know, like that, that the, it's like all greasy on the inside of the hat. And he's been playing with that, kind of losing himself from, from the trauma of what's going on in this room. And then the guy comes out, throws a few dollars at him and goes out again. And then the kid goes and go, goes to see his mum and his mum swears at him and tells him to go and get some cigarettes. And then he goes across to the saloon bar opposite and he goes to buy the cigarettes and of course, all the guys in there have all been punters and they all laugh at him. And he just feels completely like the dirty son of a whore. He's dirty, got dirty fingernails. He's like, and he looks at himself. And that gives him a desire that one day when I grow up, what's the opposite to that? I want to be powerful and I want to take revenge on these people. And then you give birth to a killer Joe. And now the character is truthified if you'd like to get in touch with us you can do so by emailing podcast at spiritualpsychologyofacting.com if you have any feedback thoughts topics you think we should cover in future episodes or questions about the spiritual psychology of acting whatever it is we'd love to hear from you the email address again is podcast at spiritualpsychologyofacting.com. You can find it in the description of the podcast. Now, back to this week's episode. So, three dimensional acting is really the creating layers. So what you would, you know, going with that uh, mind triad and, you know, mind triad mean the three fundamental building blocks of the character's psyche. Um, the first being the character's self-image, which in Killer Joe was a, a, a dirty son of a whore. You would first of all create that thinking and that pain and the suffering of the character and the loneliness of the character as well. 
and get into that and think that and create the character's suffering. So you want to put that at the back, you know, to sit there in the back of the eyes, as it were, by having those thoughts. And then you go straight into, you would say, because I'm the dirty son of a whore, I want to take revenge. So taking revenge, you know, throttling someone or get slicing someone's throat or, you know, killing someone. That you get the pictures of doing that. And straight away the eyes start to become dangerous, you know, yeah. when you start to think to think those thoughts. In order to feel powerful. I remember working backwards, uh, the character of Joe Cooper was disempowered as a child. So mm -hmm. what does he fantasize about as an adult is being powerful. Then as a kid, he would have seen TV cops on, you know, shows. And the, the, the characters in that are powerful. What more powerful way could you, you know, position could you put yourself in society as being a, a cop? You've literally got the, the right to enforce the law, mm -hmm. um, arrest people, put them in jail, hunt them down. So, you, you know, his, his um, id tensions are justified in that. So then you would create in the background, because I'm a dirty son of a whore, and that's the suffering. I want to take revenge to be powerful. And then what you have in the eyes, obviously, if people are listening to this uh, as a recording rather than sort of the, the YouTube video, what you'll see is the layers. And then so what you've got is behind it, that thinking. So you mm -hmm. see the character's pain. And it's interesting that in the play, the character Dottie says to him a couple of times, your eyes hurt. Yeah. Your eyes hurt. And what does she mean by that is I can see your pain. And she and that's what makes her fall in love with him. You know, makes her idealize him because she can relate to him because she shares the same pain. She's been a victim of her um, mother's unfinished thinking. And so they relate together. You know, it's a, it's a um, strange uh, falling in love. You know, they resonate at the same vibrationary frequency. They recognize something. They feel each other's pain. And he wants to rescue her because he sees that pain in her and he wants to rescue her and she wants to be rescued. You know, she has fantasies of someone coming and rescuing from this and he's her knight in shining armor. I mean, he's the perfect boyfriend for her, you know? <laughs> In a twisted sense, yeah, but yeah. In a twisted sense, yeah. Well, that's what's yeah. so brilliant about the play. Yeah. It plays with these things. It makes us question. It keeps us on the edge of our seat. Yeah. So that's how, how you do it. So, I mean, obviously, in the course, we go into great detail and we do this a lot. But this is the core technique, really, is the ability to create these layers of thinking. And that's what I mean by three dimensions. The third dimension, the final thing, is what we call the character's germ. And that's a, a term that came from Nemerinovich Danchenko. And Danchenko was Stanislavski's partner in crime. Really, the system of Stanislavski should be called the system of Konstantin Stanislavski and Nemerinovich Danchenko. Um, <laughs> but, but Stanislavski wrote the book, so he, he got the credit for it. <laughs> and um, But Danchenko, one of the things he brought to it, he said, well, we need something to hold the character together, the essence of the character. And they use this term of a germ, not as in germ like domestos kills all known germs down the toilet, meaning germ as in essence, like wheat germ, the essence of the character. And the essence of the character of Killer Joe, what we gave him was a sheriff. And what's a sheriff? A sheriff is a cowboy with a badge, with the law on his side. So do you see that, that, that it would be the first layer is the dirty son of a whore. That's the pain of the character. That's what drives them. And then the purpose, which is I want to take revenge to be powerful. And then what they present, their personality, their germ is, we could also call it their super action. It what makes them behave and act the way they do is a sheriff. And sheriffs are, well, a cowboy is kind of um, cool, slow. I mean, these characters are Texans. 
you know, and that will you start thinking of you, you're a sheriff and that's going to affect your posture. That's going to affect the way you walk, the way you talk. And that's the last dimension, as it were, the last layer is is that. And so that, that's briefly, you know, in the course, how we go about creating that. And of course, it needs practice. We need to do lots of these to, for, for the technique to click of how to do it. So it will become second nature. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the skills is analyzing it. You know, we cover that a lot in the course of how do you come up with these things? How do you go about it? And then the second part is how do you program it? How do you embody it and actually wear it? It's rather like putting on layers of clothes. Yeah. And then you just let it just sit there. And that's mm-hmm. then that's what it means to be the character. You're in the character's mind triads because you've created the character's psyche. And then you don't have to show anything. You are the cat. You're thinking those thoughts. And you have to trust that, that once that you've, you've programmed them, that they kind of just sit there in the body. You have to bring them into the body. You know, you, I, I say let the thinking go you know, right down to the tips of your toes, to the tips of your fingers. So every atom of your body is... A dirty son of a whore wants to be um, take revenge in order to be powerful and is is a sheriff. Mm-hmm. And then I get them walking about and then I get them having a shave, getting ready to go on a date. And they really discover the character. Well, you did the exercise, didn't you? You did that. It's one of the ones we cover. What was your experience of it? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. Is also when you when you were talking about that whole life situation, that was something that we went to an active imagination, you know, how we would you know ruminate on that that very situation and it was amazing how much when even just describing it there it brought it all back and it's amazing how much empathy i felt again for that character because it you know it was essentially it was a part of it felt like a part of me you know it was something i i'd thought the pictures were almost as vibrant and all i needed to do was to activate them was just get that little prompt again so that's interesting in, in, in the first case but yeah it was it's you know like you've said killer joe's a fantastic play to to use because it's so full of these rich gritty characters, you know, that you can really get your teeth sunk into. But yeah, it's, it, it sounds like a very simple process. And for those who, you know, haven't taken the course, it sounds ludicrously easy, but it is, it is, that's, it's, it's that simple. And that's definitely the, the, what I got from it was that realizing that there's just a few simple steps that activate your imagination and the character is just formed. You know, it, obviously it does take time like to get those pictures and impressions. You do need to take the time to let those soak in and make them vibrant. And the more vibrant you make them, like you said, the more suffering the character experiences, the more they want to take revenge, the more powerful they want to be. And that's it gives you as an actor loads to play with. I, I don't think that ever runs dry. I think that's my experience from, from working on that, which we did. You know, we worked on it quite a lot over over a series of months. And everybody had a go at that character as well is that it's amazing how much you don't have to try you don't have to to force a character you don't even if you don't feel you know when you're reading the play oh i wouldn't be this character you know if i wouldn't be cast as this character but the more you work on it the more you realize it's easily accessible well as an actor you should in theory be able to play any part because yeah. if you if you understand how to act properly you know in the same way as a, an architect should be able to design any building an actor should be able to create any part when you realize that, you know, that there's a systematic technique of how do you get the script? How do you break it down? How do you embody these things? You realize you can do anything. You might not be appropriate casting physically yeah. for it or yeah. even the right sex to play yeah. the character. Um, but you know, really, if you've got the technique, you can play any part. It's just a question of knowing how to do it. Yeah. Actually, when you said that as well, you know, we, Another play we worked on was Dangerous Liaisons. And I would say one of the the most kind of intense breakthroughs I ever had in, in, in class was when we worked on, on the character there. And I can't remember the name of the character. It was the female we worked on. Um, oh, you mean um, Madame Torvel? Torvel, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we worked on the, on the character of Madame Torvel from Dangerous Liaisons. And, you know, that's not my casting. I would never be cast as that part. But it's one of the, the most in character moments I've ever felt. We did the same process, you know, we, we worked on that mind triad, obviously a different mind triad for a, for a different character. But yeah, I, I can't describe the, the the feeling was that I just felt in, intensely like that character. And there was nothing else getting in the way. There was no other intrusive thoughts of 
you know, you're a bloke or you've got a beard or, you know, you've, you know, or you're, you're not from that period of time. You know, there, nothing else was getting in the way. It was, it was amazing how much, and actually how I felt as well as, as a straight male, how I felt the desire that she would feel for, for her lover. You know, there was that, that, that and all of a sudden it became my desire and it was the character's thinking. It was just pure, purely put on without any other intrusive thoughts. And it was, like we've said before, that light of consciousness that was shining through this lampshade, this character creation. And that really, you know, Killer Joe is one thing, but to play that part, or to, to feel that level of, you know, engrossment in a character shows how, how foolproof that method is to access any character. Well, I, I deliberately use, I mean, we, we, I think we, we did all the characters, all five characters in Killer Joe. We did exercises mm -hmm. on creating all of those different characters, um, got guided exercises, and they're all in the course. Um, but also I like to bring in those other, other, other characters as well. So you all have the realization, oh, wow, I can apply this to anything and I can play any part. And that's yeah. hugely empowering for the actor. You know, it just kills Absolutely. fear. It doesn't matter that when, when, when the, you know, the agent or the casting director phones you up, says, I've got an audition for you or a self tape for you. The first reaction isn't fear. The first reaction is, yeah, well, whatever it is, I know I can play it because I know the steps to, to how to create it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You touched on there. Um, the, the dangerous liaisons, there's a character in there, Valmont. And Valmon is slightly different. I mean, he he's he's actually in many ways he's a hero of the thing. It's his story. He's the first person. It's about Valmon. Um, but he's an, an he, he you know you could say he's got some psychopathic tendencies. Madame uh, Matoy, she's certainly a, a psychopath, and she she says that you know her favorite thing is cruelty. I mean that that's um, psychopathic thinking. But um, Valmont is another interesting character because it, he's a narcissist. He's a grandiose narcissist. Mm. And there's a difference between, you know, the, the narcissism. In, in psychological terms, narcissism is self-directed libido. And the difference is, the, you know, they, they do say, uh, share some similar traits with psychopathic thinking. Sense of entitlement. Uh, sense of being superior in some way, um, sense that they they envy and envy others. Uh, they use and abuse people. So some someone often nice narcissists will, uh, someone with narcissistic thinking will think that other people are useful and therefore other people are disposable. They have those, but what sets the narcissist apart is the grandiosity. Mm. Uh, is thinking that they're special or superior. So whereas those psychopathic characters would have more purposes like I want to be powerful, I want to take revenge, the, the narcissistic character would have more purposes like I want to be special, I want to be superior, I want to be admired, I want to be adored, <laughs> that they're attached to those kinds of purposes. And they're fun to play as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, yeah, so you've... you've... We have touched upon some of those purposes that you know mainly crop up time and time again in in playing villains or you know the ones that are the most successful. But it'd be good to maybe then go into a bit more detail about for what purposes actually are. So for many actors, they'll they'll know you know intentions or objectives. You know that's that's quite common terminology. So for 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 those non actors and those who haven't really worked with purposes before, can you go into a bit more detail about what exactly a purpose is? Yes. Well, well, my, my teacher, Sam Kogan, was a real stickler for this. He was uh, very clear on these definitions. And we use the same definitions that that um, motivate the problem when you say what's the character's motivation is motivation mixes cause and effect. So, for example, um, if it's raining and you decide to take an umbrella and the director says to you, what's your what's your motivation for taking the umbrella? You could either say because it's raining which is the cause, or you could say, because I want to keep dry, which is the desire, you know, so it mixes those two things, which are two different things. So um, in the terminology we use, the event would be the rain. That's what's making you have your purpose. And then the purpose would be to keep dry, right? Well, the objective would be to keep dry. The purpose might be something like to be comfortable, 
because you don't want to turn up sodding wet in wherever you're arriving. Or it could even be, I want to be admired because my hair is all nice and sleek and I don't want that to get wet. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it could be many different. That's the beauty yeah. of it. It could be, have many different purposes depending on the character. With, with the same objective can fulfill many different purposes. So, an obje- so a purpose is an impression of happiness. That's how I define it anyway. It's a, an impression of happiness. It's a feeling of happiness. And there are some, as far as we've found, through all the plays, all the private sessions, all the work that has been done over the years, there are about 180 human purposes. And we've actually got a course, um, The Spectrum of Human Desire, which is one of the modules of the Spiritual Psychology of Acting course. It's module three, The Spectrum of Human Purposes, where we go through all the purposes we name every single one, we give the definition, and I give examples. I sort of try to, I embody the purpose, and I try to kind of share it with the viewer so they get the feel, the the, the resonant vibration of that so they can wear it themselves. And that's really what the body of the, the, the technique is made of. But a purpose is an impression of happiness. So, for example, if someone wants to be superior, what they really want is to feel the feeling that they're better than other people. And therefore, they want other people to think they're not as good. So they want others to feel inferior so they can feel superior, which is different to, say, wanting to be admired. Now, if you want to be admired, it's that feeling that uh, you've got the eyes on you and everybody thinks you're great. And they admire you, the men envy you, the women desire you, uh, that kind of thing. That's more like I, 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 I want to be admired. And they're different flavors. They're different impressions. I mean, pure acting technique is the ability to just activate these pure in- impressions when you know what they are. Um, an objective is the means by which you achieve your purpose. So if my purpose, taking the the, the, uh, umbrella and the rain example, if my purpose was I want to be admired because I want my hair to stay as I set it for the meeting, I want to be admired in the meeting, uh, I want to keep dry would be the objective. Mm -hmm. So it's the means by which I achieve my purpose. My action is what I do to achieve my purpose. And actions always come as verbs. You know, I preen um i take pride uh i shrink i attack i retreat i stand my ground i warn i care uh i assess i plan my revenge do you see what i mean these are the, the psychological actions and of course that's an enormous part of the course is the understanding of psychological actions and of course most importantly how to act them and it's also important to say that they're different from intentions, aren't they? Intentions are like conscious, aware purposes. Purposes are are mainly subconscious in in most people, aren't they? Exactly. So that's what's implied. It's got to be understood that by by using the word purpose, what we mean is a desire, which to the most part in most people is subconscious, is below the level of consciousness. An intention is a conscious purpose, a purpose is a subconscious intention is the easiest way to look at that. But because most in life, most people aren't aware of their purposes. Mm-hmm. They're not, they're not really aware of why they're doing it. I remember when I first went to drama school and I was learning about purposes. Um, I went to the pub with some friends in the, in the Christmas break. And um, there's the, the bar the, the manager kept on coming over us and talking to us and, and uh, trying to impress us with these stories. And uh, one of my friends said to me, who you know wasn't an actor, didn't study acting, he said, um, um, what do you think of that guy? And I said, he's okay. He has a big he has a big need to be admired. And my friend went, that's not a very nice thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> Like that was some sort of accusation. I mean, for me, I was trying to understand characters. It's like if I were to create that character, what would my purpose be? My purpose would be to be admired. That's why he was telling us all these impressive stories and his eyebrows were going, you know, and he was like, he wanted to impress us. 
Um, but to, to, the, to the uninitiated, that sounded like a very personal, that was very personal. He wants to be admired. He just said, that's not a very nice thing to say about somebody, as if that was a great insult. Yeah. You know, but, but in our culture in drama school, it's like that's how we thought we thought that we understood it. Not not to um, denigrate or label anybody, but just to understand what motivated them to say the things they did, they said and to do the things they do. Yeah, it's an important distinction to make, I think, with you know, intention and purpose, because that's something I always struggle with in playing characters that the that trying to analyze the intention felt to me much like over analyzing and it's not a way into the character. As a purpose, you know, someone can you know have the purpose. I want to suffer, but it's not them actually wanting to suffer. It's more just it's an unconscious thing in the back of their head that they want to suffer because they're going to be cared for. You know, it it, it can it can lead, it can it's it's there for a reason, isn't it? In that case, it would in that example you've just given that the the suffering would be an objective to the purpose to I the want purpose. to be cared for. Yeah, but but I want to suffer can also be a purpose. Yeah. They anticipate suffering that it might, mm. you know, it, it might be cemented in because it has payoffs like yeah. suffering. People are rescued, suffering. People have no responsibility, suffering. People are cared for. Yeah. It might yeah, be. Yeah. But the actually um, what I found is, is people can have a genuine desire to suffer. I mean, that's what's meant by self-directed mortido. The mm. shadow purposes are all forms of self-directed mortido. You know the 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 shadow the shadow purposes is is, is um, uh, are the dark ones which start with I want to suffer I want to fail you know I want to be betrayed um, I want to be rejected I want to be humiliated I want to be deceived uh, do you see I me mean, these are very mm -hmm. these are much more um, unconscious until you make them conscious you know yeah. e everything's unconscious until you make it conscious. <laughs> So then talking about those purposes then for villains, like you said, with each of the purposes, there is a definition to help with that impression, to help as an actor understand, or even as a person trying to figure out your own self and your own you know, idiosyncrasies. So I want to be powerful. The definition for that is I want other people to be either so enamoured or so afraid of me that they feel obliged to become my slaves. Yes, to do my will. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which would come, psychologically speaking, comes from, as we said earlier, would come, you know, if you wanted to create that truthfully, that would come from some sort of disempowerment. Or, yeah. on the other hand, they always were. If you think about, uh, you know, one of the arch villains in um, human history, Adolf Hitler, mm -hmm. uh, very uh, fascinating villain in terms of villains, you know, is what was going on there psychologically. Well, um, from what I've understood, um, he had an interesting mixture because he had a father who w hated him. He was the fourth child. He had three older sisters, and and he was um, he was the youngest with with boy. He was a boy, and his father, I suspect, had a an Oedipus complex that he was transferring onto young Adolf meaning that his unresolved Oedipus complex, his unresolved uh, desire to unite with his mother and get his father out of the way, was being transferred onto Adolf. So he had massive problems with his father. Uh, in fact, he said that, you know, he, that, that he, you know, they were, he was Austrian and he was, he was a very patriotic Austrian, hence why Hitler was such a patriotic German. Um, in opposite, opposition to that. And he even spoke with a very, very thick German accent, basically to piss his father off. Um, so what you had there is, is someone who wanted to take revenge on their father. But at the same time, he had a mother who idolized him and put him on a pedestal. So you've got a narcissistic psychopath. Yeah. Which, uh, you know, do you see what I mean? He had yeah. the narcissism. He believed he was great because his mother idealized him. But at the same time, he had that hatred towards something, which is generated by uh, projecting out his desire to take revenge on his father. And there's an interesting theory that, that Jung had about the Nazis. And that was that um, because of the ideal of the Aryan super race that they'd 
um, got stuck with at that time. And the idea that they were superior race and this ideal, you know, of this perfect, perfect human being, that created a short form because at the end of the day, we're all human beings and we all have flaws. And but to the idealized, you know, image of, of the psyche, that flaw created a shadow in the psyche. And then what did the Germans do with that collective shadow, Jung guessed? They en masse projected it onto the Jews. Mm. So that was a shadow projection. And I always think that's a fascinating way of looking at it, that, you know, it's uh, dealing with their own unfinished thinking. And this we find, don't we? That's what projection is. It's projecting parts of ourselves that we don't accept. And if you have this idealization, the desire to be perfect, the desire to be right, there's a massive shortfall, long fall between the ideal and the reality and that the depth of that um, d- difference between the ideal and the reality is the depth of the shadow it creates. Mm-hmm. Then what are you going to do with the shadow? Mm-hmm. You're going to project it onto other people. Mm-hmm. And, and I think understanding some of these psychodynamics are really helpful to the actor uh, to understand how to structure the character and what's going on. Because at the end of the day, your job is to truthify the character. Stanislavski said, it doesn't matter what you think about the character, right? That's really important. You don't judge the character. It doesn't matter what you think about the character. All that matters is what the character thinks. Yeah. That's your job is to truthfully create it. Then the drama, you know, because you have to play the character's function within the drama. So you have to act it psychologically truthfully or the play won't stand up. You know, for the play to deliver its thesis, every actor has to create their character truthfully. So I, I find that a really useful tool is to understand it doesn't matter what my opinion is of this character, whether I like them or not. And actually to act a character well, because nothing human is alien to me, you should be able to relate to it. You know, mm-hmm. all these things exist within the human psyche. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, there's a, a famous quote of his. He says that there's one mind common to all individuals and each individual is an inlet to universal mind he says what a saint has felt you can feel what plato has thought you might think we could add to that you know um what dennis nielsen you know killing for company he was essentially lonely you know, he did that. He wanted no one. He was felt abandoned. No one stayed. So, how did he go about out doing that? Um, yeah, the, the, these these characters that that we have uh, in real history, let alone just in 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 stage and screen history. Mm-hmm. It's a, well, it's a great example because David Tennant himself playing Dennis Nielsen. I mean, when you see in interviews, he he talks about him very disparagingly. You know, he loathes him as a person. And you know, he has has obviously has his own opinions about him, like we all would. You know, despise the, the acts and despise, you know, all that what the person did. But when he's playing that character, he doesn't judge him at all. Your empathy doesn't necessarily mean that you empathise with that person full stop. It's just your job as an actor to put on the character's thinking. I, I find that as well with um, the Netflix series You. It's basically about a serial killer, and Penn Badgley, the the actor who plays him, he talks about him in interviews and. He's probably the worst advocate for the character you've ever come across. You know, most people are attracted to him because it's a very sexy, you know, stylistic show. All the women fancy him. All the men admire him. You know, as a character because that's the function of the drama. You know, you're you're in kind of led into his his thinking process. But Penn Badgley, as the actor, detests the character. But when he's playing him, he, that doesn't show through. He's completely the character because he's got that the character's thoughts. You know completely and in his mind and that's the distinction isn't it as an actor that you well, that's you, good acting well there you go well and for an actor to play the the villains is where they really get to flex their muscles and their their you know their you were you reminded me earlier on of a list so you had a a list of actors that have won academy awards playing villains would you like to share that list with us because it's yeah. a really good list it is it's a very interesting list and it's something i hadn't really ever considered before that so many 
characters that are villains have been the, you know, the ones that have won the Oscar. But I mean, you, you go all the way back to the 1930s and uh, Frederick March winning for Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. But it's it's been a much more recent trend, I think. Well, Forrest Whitaker playing Edie, I mean, he's one of the only ones that is a, is a true life character. Um, but the rest, you've got J.K. Simmons for Whiplash, you know, Louise Fletcher as Nurse Ratchet in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Kathy Bates as Annie Wilkes in Misery, terrifying, Anthony Hopkins as Hannibal Lecter, one of the all-time classics, Daniel Day-Lewis in There Will Be Blood, a much more kind of grey area of villain, but a villain nonetheless, you would say. Obviously Heath Ledger for The Joker, and Christoph Waltz for Hans Landa in Inglorious Bastards, and uh, and Javier Bardem, uh, who played Anton Sugar in, in the Coen Brothers film No Country for Old Men. And he's an interesting one, actually, because I remember hearing in an interview when he was talking about getting the part, he said, you know, when he was approached by the Coen Brothers, he he said he was completely the wrong person for this part, that he couldn't really speak English that well. And he, you know, he absolutely detests violence. And the Coens were like, well, that's exactly why we want to hire you. And I think that's that's an interesting point to make, is that most actors who who do portray villains really well actually are the nicest, most humblest people that you could meet. The ones who are connected to their emotional truth. And, and uh, you know, Mean Girls, they, uh, they talked about Rachel McAdams playing the school bully and how she's completely not that in real life. She's the most loveliest person you could meet. And that's why she's able to to portray that. Yeah, well, um, an unhappy actor can't even really play unhappy characters well because they're burdened by their own unhappiness <laughs> even if they're you know doing some sort of method thing where they're stoking up their own unhappiness for it it's their own unhappiness not the character's unhappiness mm. whereas happy if you call happy what we mean by that is ones with finished thinking the actors that have finished off their thinking you know dealt worked on their traumas worked on their, their past set themselves free they can play any character they can play so-called happy characters or they can they can play suffering parts you know nothing human is alien to me we you know we should be able to play every part you've been listening to the spiritual psychology of acting podcast please join us again next week when we'll have another interview with a very special guest but until then take good care and we'll see you again next time Thank you to Charlie Robinson, she helps with the video editing and artwork for this podcast, and to omid 16 b for providing the music. The track is called Love and is available on all streaming platforms.